So uh, when you think of COVID-19, you may not think of dating, um, but uh, social distancing and quarantine measures have made dating very complicated. And we've seen this sort of pop up uh, in, for example, health briefings from governments and dating apps themselves are a technology that have been mentioned. So for example, Newfoundland's health minister uh, was on record as saying that if you use Tinder or Grindr and you swipe right, you might get more than you bargained for. Uh, dating apps that are on our phones tend to use geolocational technology to uh, locate those who are around us and facilitate um, uh, connection with them, right? So the main sort of way that these apps are designed is to facilitate in-person meeting. And so these apps get implicated when meeting in person actually becomes something that is highly risky and potentially dangerous. Uh, so there have been op-eds that came out um, early in the spring about dating app companies and how they have to do something in relation to COVID-19. Otherwise, they might have blood on their hands in terms of users um, contracting the virus and dying, as we've seen high death rates in some countries. Um, at the same time, there has been a surge in use of dating apps. So several companies such as Tinder have reported that people uh, during lockdown times are jumping on their apps more to connect with others and perhaps to address some of that loneliness uh, that the previous speaker mentioned. And so this puts, this creates a situation where dating app companies actually must respond to the pandemic. There's public health pressure for them to respond. They have to prove their relevance in a world where you may not be able to meet up in person anymore. So then why would you need a dating app? And um, this is also can be seen by these companies as an opportunity to capitalize on people using their technology more during this time. Um, so myself uh, and my uh, co-researchers were interested in this question of how are dating and hookup apps responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as well as associated public health guidelines and restrictions. So we took an approach of mixed methods. Uh, one approach that we took was non-participant observation on 16 apps. So getting on the apps and seeing what are the actual um, messages sent to users, what sorts of features and interventions might they be introducing. We also um, collected materials that dating app companies were circulating. So uh, grabbing screenshots of their blog posts, their Instagram posts, stories, uh, press releases and analyzing what are the messages that they're putting out there for their users and for the general public. And we contextualize this by looking at news and media articles uh, published in English about dating during the context of a pandemic. So today I'm going to share with you uh, just a few key uh, themes that are coming up in all these materials that we've been collecting and analyzing. And the first is uh, looking at the way that dating apps are shifting into the role of being public health actors. Um, looking at how they're introducing practices related to virtual dating and how they are putting out messaging that is intended to normalize social distancing and this form of virtual dating. Okay, so to jump into that, um, what you see here are some screenshots from in-app messages to users uh, taken from the sort of beginning uh, March 2020 when North America, Canada and the US specifically were starting to really go into uh, social distancing measures and lockdown um, and a lot of these app companies are based in the US so they would be affected uh, of, around that timeline and so these are messages that they sent directly to their users in the app letting them know that um, you know we recommend that you keep dating uh, but keep things online so very much taking a direct approach saying don't meet up right now during this time um, and also often linking users to the World Health Organization guidelines. So sociologist Deborah Lupton writes about digital health technologies as a wide range of technologies that generally engage in activities to promote health and well-being and avoid illness and here we can see that these dating apps are sort of taking on the role of commercial digital health technologies by doing that, by conveying this information about COVID-19. Um, for apps that um, their primary user base happens to be queer men um, and gay men, a lot of the time they were mobilizing 
initiatives and infrastructures that already existed for um, spreading awareness and information about STIs and HIV, and then also testing for HIV and STIs. So if you um, got tested for COVID-19, uh, through a similar sort of infrastructure, you could let the app know, and the app would then let people who you've been in contact with know that you got tested and they should go get tested. So it's interesting that these pre-existing sort of initiatives were, have also been mobilized um, to help trace COVID-19. A lot of apps put out messaging um, that recognize that health is something that is interconnected in many different ways. As we just saw, there's lots of different factors that shape um, people's health. And so some of their messaging acknowledge this, uh, trying to send out messages to users about upkeeping their mental health, their sexual health, as well as uh, diminishing their risks for COVID-19. So this was some of the messaging that we saw that kind of addressed that more holistic view of health. So many of these apps also rolled out features and functions to support virtual dating. And virtual dating is a phrase that showed up in a lot of the messaging that we saw. Um, and it didn't often, it wasn't often defined by these apps and sometimes was spoken about differently in their messaging. But it can be thought of as a set of practices and associated meanings that facilitate and reinforce non-physical interactions. So for some apps, this was a matter of making a feature that was premium uh, free for, for their users. So for example, Tinder usually only lets you swipe within a certain radius around you. If you pay for Tinder premium, then you get to swipe with people all over the world. So you could match, with, match and chat with um, someone who's in a totally different country or on a different continent from you. Um, and so they made this feature free for a month uh, during the, uh, the spring so that people could connect more broadly. And this is also, you can see, a bit, this could be a business strategy uh, that if users are, are taking advantage of this feature and finding it useful for uh, appeasing their loneliness, then they might uh, be more likely to subscribe to Tinder premium once uh, the feature is no longer offered for free. Some apps rolled out entirely new features. So for example, this is a screen grab of a blog post by Bumble, and it shows that uh, on Bumble now you can put on your profile what they call a virtual date badge to signal that you are open to uh, dating without physical contact, and then you can engage in video calling. Um, so they make video calling available right through their app. Um, there were other apps that also rolled out video calling. Um, the app Match, they called it Vibe Check. So you can video call someone in the app and you can get a good vibe on them. Um, and then there were other apps that if they were not rolling out these features, they were referring, other, they were referring their users to um, use other platforms such as Zoom. So the idea is that you meet on the app on the dating app, so it retains its relevance. Uh, and then you take it further to get to know the person by moving it to a video conferencing application um, or platform that, that they suggest. And so a lot of the time, this also took the form of events held by these apps, such as speed dating events, as you can see here. So um, of course, we're not really used to any of this, <laughs> and it's new. And when that happens, some, sometimes new practices are bound to be awkward. And so what we were also seeing from dating app companies are efforts to try and normalize these practices around virtual dating. Part of this has to do with longstanding perceptions that connections made online are not as authentic as connections made in person. Uh, and so here you can see Tinder, um, showcasing a tweet that kind of uh, takes, takes a hit at that long-standing perception. And so it says, Rem remember when everyone hid that they met online and now it's like, ew, you met in society, right? And so trying to normalize this idea of meeting and making a, a true authentic connection through the dating app without that physical connection. Um, also in terms of building social scripts and norms around virtual dating, uh, these app companies put out a proliferation of advice columns, tips, lists, suggestions uh, about everything uh, in terms of how to go about virtual dating. 
right? So you can see, make sure your phone and laptop are fully charged and sanitized. Quite often the advice was to get out of your sweatpants and dress up for a virtual date. Um, there were tons of lists of virtual date ideas. So you can cook together. Uh, you can order each other Uber Eats and it's romantic if you guess what the person's favorite food is. And then Match uh, went as far as even employing um, these experts that you could either call a hotline or you could submit your question online um, uh, about dating while distancing and their experts would respond. And you can see here that if the question was, you know, um, <laughs> we're in a pandemic or I just started dating again, should I continue with my plan? Should I continue dating? Uh, these companies' answers were always yes, continue dating, just not in person. And often those answers were followed by here, use some of our online features to connect. Uh, but for people to actually jump on board and do something, a lot of the time an activity has to have meaning constructed around it. And so this is where we saw that the dating app started to construct um, meanings around social distancing and virtual dating. And a lot of the mainstream apps that mostly are marketed to a heterosexual user base tended to have messaging around romance and the possibility of generating romance if you're having a distanced relationship. So here we can see from OkCupid, they say 85% of our users say it's important to first develop an emotional connection with a partner. Then Coffee Meets Bagel asks their users on Instagram what romantic gestures can be done virtually. And then the blog from Match uh, even asks very opportunistically, lockdown, a time for love? Um, and so here we can see these apps are trying to frame distancing and virtual dating as something that can give rise to romance in this sort of abstinence-based uh, model of courtship that really um, harks back to traditional dating scripts, traditional heteronormative dating scripts that say that prolonging in person, prolonging sexual contact can give rise to more romance. In contrast, apps that were generally marketed towards queer user bases um, tended to construct social distancing and vir virtual dating as, uh, se as sexy. That if you're abiding by the guidelines and you're being responsible for yourself and you're being responsible to your community, then that's something that we should applaud as sexy. Um, and so you can see that Grindr uh, interviewed adult entertainers and um, showcased photos of them on their Instagram, uh, sort of providing pornography as this option for sexual, um, a sexual outlet during the pandemic uh, that doesn't put you at higher risk. Similarly, apps also, um, we can see in the previous screenshot, the Her app, promoting sending um, nude photos <laughs> as something that can give a sexual connection but not put you at risk. And then Grindr even went on to um, sell and give out, um, oh, give out masks um, for their users, right? And so you can see here that mask wearing, distancing is being constructed as a very sexually appealing activity. So we're still working through these different findings and um, trying to put more analysis to them. But just from the examples that I've shown you today, you can see that dating apps have indeed made notable interventions during the pandemic. They've responded to COVID-19. They're not acting like it's not happening. Um, and in their interventions, they have become health information sources. So you can see them getting out messaging and links and resources to their users. And they've also taken steps to try and shape behavior, right? So offering new functionalities for new be behaviors that they're constructing as virtual dating and in turn normalizing non-physical interactions um, and making social distancing romantic or sexy depending which app you're using. However, these are commercial apps and so we have to be a bit um, critical in terms of looking at, okay, what role can commercial apps play as digital health, health technologies? And we need to ask where is the accountability, right? So a lot of the time app companies, they make decisions about what features to offer, what messages to send out, um, and users receive these messages and they can use these features, um, but there's not always a lot of 
um, back and forth between what users want and what actually becomes available in an app. We also have to remember that these apps have profit motives, right? So increased uptake during a pandemic um, means that they could uh, in turn make more money. And so we're seeing, for example, when dating apps host online events, often there are product placements or there's brand sponsorships and also more people getting on these apps means more data. And especially if they're apps that are taking data about people and their health status, we need to know where that data is going and who it's being shared with. And finally, messages that romanticize distance dating tend to reinforce uh, notions around sexuality that are stigmatized, right? So our society um, has long associated sex and especially casual sex with risk, disease, death, immorality. And in terms of trying to reinforce uh, social distancing, there is a risk of, again, re uh, taking this recourse back to this negative view of sexuality. And so I, I would argue that instead, we need to um, have a more positive view of people's sexual needs and sexual expression um, and know that and acknowledge that that doesn't stop even though we're in a pandemic. So we need to find alternative ways. All right, um, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Duque, for that interesting talk. Uh, while we wait for a few questions, I have one. Um, my question is about platonic dating apps. So I recently learned of these, the existence of these things. So there, it's like a dating app, but it's for finding friendships rather than romantic partners. Um, I was wondering, especially considering what some of the previous speakers have said about um, loneliness being the biggest risk factor for psychological dis distress, what role these platonic apps might play in uh, interpersonal interactions during this period? Yeah, I think it, uh, I mean, what we're seeing from the app companies and the messages that they're trying to put out is that essentially it is, um, they're trying to play that role where they're helping people address their loneliness, right? And um, that this can be part of taking care of yourself by making connections with other people. And I think it can be. And some of these dating app companies also pr propose the use of their apps for making friends. Uh, Bumble has a whole subset of its app dedicated to make, making friends. But also a lot of the apps that are marketed towards queer users say, hey, you can use this to find a pen pal, find a friend um, and whatnot. And it puts a little less pressure on people and opens up a many different routes of connection. Um, so in that sense, I think it can be really positive. Um, hopefully there are other studies that go out and look at the user side of how are these messages being received. And um, if people are, as we're seeing, jump on these dating apps more, then what is the outcome of that for them and their connections? Thank you.